I'll be talking about the response of uh, native forests to climate change and the uh, population differences that we see within widespread species. And that's the main focus of the work that my lab does, which is uh, uh, quite in contrast to uh, work involved around uh, trees uh, surviving in botanical gardens, where they do have interventions such as, such as irrigation, et cetera, and where there is a fair emphasis on cultivars uh, rather than uh, uh, wild provenance material. So I study conifers, and conifers, of course, you know, they're very large. They can be very large trees. They also have very large genomes. So the, the average genome size of a conifer is about seven times that of the human genome. That's a lot of DNA. They can live for a long time. They can live for thousands of years, some of them. And they live very slow lives. They are slow to migrate, and they are slow to adapt. Um, but they also are very good at exchanging genetic material among populations. So they're wind pollinated, and pollen can travel hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. So we get this mixing of genetic material between generations. They also can survive uh, highly variable climates, and that is that an individual species can grow across a wide range of conditions. We have some very large geographic ranges that encompass a wide range of climates, but they also experience a lot of climate variability in those long lives. Uh, variability year, uh, seasonal variability, variability year to year, uh, uh, decade to decade, century to century. And we see that climate change is already affecting native uh, tree species globally. So as an example here, in California, over 130 million trees are dead due to uh, the prolonged three-year drought that they experienced, combined with insect outbreaks. Uh, we have had massive wildfires in British Columbia and in the western U.S. Uh, British Columbia, over 2% of the area of British Columbia has burned in the last two years. And if you think about what that means when your forestry rotations are in the order of 80 years, we've lost an enormous amount of forest and timber supply for the forest industry. Uh, we have had massive uh, outbreaks. Uh, we've got spruce beetle on the lower left. Uh, we've got mountain pine beetle on the right. Mountain pine beetle alone uh, took out something like 20 million hectares of pine forest in British Columbia, and in fact spurred British Columbia to become the first jurisdiction in North America with a carbon tax back in maybe 2006 or so, because people saw the direct effects of climate warming on ecosystems and on jobs and uh, livelihoods and communities. But we still see some forests that are beautifully healthy. Go for a walk in Pacific Spirit Park or in Stanley Park. Look at the beautiful trees. I was just in Mexico, uh, and I've seen some beautiful high elevation forests there that are incredibly diverse uh, and, and seem to be quite healthy, although others are suffering insect attacks. So we're seeing these changes. So now is the time. You can go to Menti again, and I would like you to use the code 92. 0014 and answer the following question. Have you seen any of the following changes in trees in your garden or your area? And uh, I'd like to know if you're seeing earlier leafing out or flowering compared to historical averages, if you have data. Uh, I'd like to see if you see species declining that have historically done well. I'd like to see if you see new species establishing well that in the past had trouble, or more than one of the above, or none of the above. And I don't think I actually need to go to Menti for you to, uh, to answer that. So I mostly study differences among provenances within species. And here we have uh, several uh, provenances of Sitka spruce, which is a species we've used for quite a bit of our work. These are trees that were grown at UBC in a common garden experiment. They're all the same age. They were grown 
uh, starting at the same time. And the difference is we picked, we cut out of this experiment a tree close to the average for each provenance. So the difference you see above, above each tree, you see the provenance of that tree. And you see a tree that's representative of growth. And we see that California Sitka spruce from coastal northern California, 12 degrees mean annual temperature, and they grow a lot. And they grow a lot because they grow for a long time each year. They may not stop growing until November. And so they're very competitive. But, of course, the flip side of that is they're not very cold hardy. And they develop, actually, relatively little cold hardiness. In contrast, we can look at the provenances from Alaska that are adapted to a short growing season. They grow for a short period of time, then they hunker down for winter. They get very cold hardy, but they don't grow very much. So this demonstrates the typical pattern we see for temperate and boreal species again and again and again. We see a trade-off between growth and cold hardiness. And I'm sure all of you are aware of that at the species level where we see that trade-off uh, between, between growth and cold hardiness. Now we also see that trees are adapted to biotic factors within their environments. Well, competition is one but also insects and diseases. If we take trees, for example, from high elevation or far north locations and we move them down to warmer locations that are still moist, we see fungal disease outbreaks on them. Uh, we also see that uh, there, there uh, are or may be differences in terms of uh, adaptation to insect pests. So what we see in general is, we, is that we have a... Um, um, a historic match between trees along a climatic gradient, for example, temperature, illustrated here on the left, and um, between the trees and the climates that they are, uh, have historically um, uh, found themselves in and adapted to. But on the right, we see a mismatch developing because the trees in a given place, the populations in a given place, are no longer adapted or well adapted to their climatic regime. And, and that doesn't mean all the trees are, are uh, poorly adapted, but it certainly means that some of them are. There is a lot of genetic diversity. So we uh, asked the question, can we use uh, genetic, climatic, and ecological information to select populations or provenances? All of you know what the word provenance means. Um, to select populations and species for new climates. And we really focus on that selecting provenances for new climates. So here we have, I prepared this photo for uh, politicians. <laughs> Most politicians have zero post, uh, uh, zero uh, post-secondary science education. They're mostly lawyers or have no education. So it's always helpful to have these kind of, <laughs> it's always helpful to have these kind of uh, illustrations. And so um, assisted migration for reforestation can be used to change uh, provenances for the same species or to plant new species to adapt to climate change. But I just want to remind you, there is quite a bit of genetic diversity within populations. And it's really important in a reforestation context that we maintain or even consider increasing that genetic diversity through combining provenances. So this is trees from one provenance out of that uh, experiment that I already showed you. So one question, well, can tree species migrate to keep up with climate change? And this is actually a photo from uh, some of the tallest trees in British Columbia. This is Sitka spruce in the Carmana Valley. Um, I, we did a really cool research project on these particular trees, but I don't have time to tell you about it. But we had professional uh, tree climbers that did the sampling for us. Um, but I am going to tell you about a study with Sitka spruce, but not these huge trees that are more or less uh, in the middle of the species range. But instead, we've used Sitka spruce to understand how tree species have migrated since the last ice age. And in fact, we've used Sitka spruce to study a current colonization migration process to understand the constraints uh, on that process. 
So my, my uh, PhD student who just finished up, Joanne Elouette, um, she studied uh, Sitka spruce on the Kodiak Archipelago in Alaska. So Sitka spruce has a range from Northern California up around to Kodiak Island uh, in Alaska, but it only reached Kodiak Island about 500 years ago. And we do not find dead trees on the island or logs lying down. And we can still see colonization going on. Only a small, maybe 15 or 20 percent of the island has forest. Sitka spruce is the only forest forming species on the island. And so it gives us the opportunity to understand the process of migration. So to do this, uh, Joanne and uh, her team sampled, first of all, wood cores from trees on the Kenai Peninsula, and then on, uh, which is uh, up above here, and then on Kodiak Island. And uh, estimated tree ages from those uh, tree ring cores, and could also estimate um, the degree of uh, crown closure, the degree of competition that those trees um, established under. And then she used genetic tools to genotype the trees for a little over 3,000 genetic markers. And so this is a comparison of the date of establishment of trees that she sampled in different age cohorts, but with the same sampling procedure on the, at Seward, so up on the Kenai Peninsula, in the open bars, so the white bars, and then on the Kodiak Archipelago. And so trees got to Kodiak uh, around 1500, but they didn't really, that population really didn't get going until around 1700. So it was very slow for those initial colonizers to um, establish. And one of the things that they needed is they needed, they needed partners, they needed mates. And mostly those mates came in the form of long distance pollen transported from faraway populations and even hybrid, um, even uh, hybridizing with white spruce. And we also see that the genetic diversity was very slow to build up. So um, the line, uh, the, the dashed line with the, the circles on it here is the pattern of development of genetic diversity in the population. And the gray, the, the gray shaded area just shows you what you would expect just randomly based on the number of trees that were sampled. And so genetic diversity was quite low for the first 200 years and then took off as the population expanded. So, it's a very slow process for tree species to migrate. Those early colonizers, first you've got to get seed dispersal to the right spot, and then they've got to develop reproductive maturity, and then they've got to have uh, other trees to mate with, and a population really doesn't get going until it's got sufficient genetic diversity. So, we also know from a lot of other information, tree species certainly cannot migrate fast enough to keep up with current climate change. So, what are the options in terms of conservation and forest management? Well, we can change the genetic material that we're planting, and that is uh, the, something I term assisted gene flow, moving, so changing seed sources, changing provenances, but still planting the same species. We can help species uh, colonize areas that are opening up on the cold margins of their distributions assisted range expansion or assisted colonization. I'm not going to talk about the long distance introduction of exotics. In our context, we only use native species for forestry in British Columbia, and we, are, we have a, a, a diverse range of species to use, and we have no need to uh, bring in other species. Um, and at this time, it would not be permitted for reforestation on our public lands, which is most of our forests. So these are all types of assisted migration, but really, um, uh, I'm going to mostly talk about assisted gene flow today. However, I will say that assisted gene flow and assisted range expansion are underway under forest policy for public lands in British Columbia. BC has been a leader in this area. Policy is going to, into effect right now called climate-based seed transfer. And uh, there have been a lot of tools developed to inform and to guide what provenances in particular, but also what species should be used for reforestation for the 250 million 
native tree species that are planted in British Columbia annually. And I will just mention for our U.S. colleagues that B.C. is the same size, or a bit, is actually a bit bigger than California plus Oregon plus Washington. So we're talking about quite a large geographic area. So what species are we actually moving, uh, bringing into areas that they're not native to? Well, one example, and the first example, is western larch, Larix occidentalis. It's native only to the southeastern corner of BC, where you see these green <coughs> and pink, uh, pinky purple polygons. Um, but it has been approved for planting in yellow and green areas beyond that. Um, However, it's got to be in just certain ecological, uh, fine-grained ecological units under our biogeoclimatic zone, and you can only plant up to 10% of any cut block to western larch in case it's being moved too far too fast. So hedging bets. But for most of our species, when we project the future range, geographic range, as in this 2050s uh, figure here, we see huge areas of overlap with the present range. This is for lodgepole pine and for the interior spruce complex, which is Ingleman spruce, white spruce, and the, the hybrid populations between the two. And so mostly we're talking about assisted gene flow. And for assisted gene flow, there are four sources of information that, that we can use. First of all, if we have no genetic information, we can do uh, what the Melbourne Garden is doing, and we can just use climate models as a best guess. But we need to know what variables to uh, focus in on. Next, the traditional means of, of matching trees to climate in forestry is to do field provenance trials. These are uh, partial reciprocal transplant studies that are plant where you take a bunch of provenances and you plant them together on a bunch of different sites and you determine what the climatic response of those provenances is. We can do seedling experiments where we push seedlings into treatments, different treatments, temperature and moisture treatments. Um, and uh, a method that we use in my lab a lot is to use genomic tools to understand these things. So I'm going to go through each of these. First of all, climate models. Here's a simple map that shows mean annual temperature for the uh, old British Columbia seed zones on the left under current, and then a projection for the 2050s. And what you can see here is that these maps don't match. And so if we stick with the old seed zones, we're not setting ourselves up very well. So we can use climatic data. And I want to mention a climate tool for all of you in North America. Climate NA is software that was developed uh, by Tong Lee Wong and Andreas Hammond. Uh, actually, when both of them were postdocs in my lab, they're both uh, faculty members now uh, uh, at University of Alberta and at UBC. And uh, that software is, will give you more precise estimates within North America than WorldClim and a wider range of variables. And it's also quite a friendly interface, either downloadable or, or using online. So that was Climate NA. That was used to generate um, uh, this climate data. So we can use climate models, but we've got to be very careful. First of all, there's uncertainty around which of the um, GCMs, the, the uh, global climate models that you're using for projections. And secondly, there are different projections for um, whether or not the human race gets its act together on carbon emissions. But there's another thing that comes into play, which is the idea of novel climates. Are we going to just see equivalent conditions to somewhere else that we know? So will we uh, in Vancouver just see conditions emerge that are like the climates that we find in maybe southern Oregon or northern California? Or are we going to get combinations of climate variables that don't occur anywhere within our reference space. And that is called, so that's called a novel climate. And the work of a former PhD student of mine, Colin Mowney, looked at this for North America. And if we take RCP 4.5, which is a middle of the road uh, climate change scenario limiting, if we manage to limit our uh, climate change impacts to about 2 degrees Celsius, and the dark areas you see here are areas with novel climates. 
emerging, projected to emerge. And so what this means is we don't have ecological analogs. We don't really know how things will respond because we don't have anything to compare it to. Now, if we look at 8.5, which is the scenario that Chris was using, we have novel climates all over the place. So I would say, whatever you do, you need to hedge your bets. And you can do that because botanical gardens are full of diversity. OK, provenance trials. I already showed you an example of the Sitka spruce variation. Here's an example from lodgepole pine. Different provenances have different uh, growth rates, and they have different optimal temperatures for growth. BC is putting in, uh, has put in a huge trial called the Assisted Migration and Adaptation Trial, where they've planted 15 species, uh, up to six provenances of each of those species, and they've planted them on 48 test sites, ranging from Northern California up to the BC-Yukon border. And trials like this are invaluable in the long term to give us information not just on tree growth, but at what point do the trees die? How far can we push them? How far can they survive? But you've got to wait a long time to get good data from that. So we're using faster methods. One of the things we do a lot is seedling experiments. We do these in growth chambers, we do them in greenhouses, and we do them outdoors in raised nursery beds. Now, uh, Chris is worried about maximum temperature, number of days over 35 degrees Celsius. What we have to keep in mind in temperate and boreal climates is the single thing that provenances differ for is their adaptation to low temperatures, and that is cold hardiness. And if we, so to show you that, here we have, we do artificial cold tests. I've got about eight people in my lab, like Saturdays, Sundays, evenings, right now doing cold hardiness tests on thousands of plants, and it is a big pain. But it's really important information. So here we have each of these dots is uh, one provenance that we sampled, grew in a common garden experiment for interior spruce, and we did artificial freeze tests with electrolytic leakage uh, of needles that were frozen to test temperatures. If the circle is dark blue, the provenance had a high cold hardiness. If it's red, they had low cold hardiness. And this is over British Columbia and Alberta, so quite a large geographic area. And this is a map of, uh, of 30 year extreme minimum temperature from uh, climate North America. It used to be climate Western North America, it's been expanded. And what you see is that these patterns align. The provenances have a level of cold hardiness that reflects the minimum temperatures where they came from. And we repeatedly find minimum coldest month temperature, number of frost-free days, et cetera, are the variables that show the most genetic, are associated with the strongest genetic patterns. In fact, in our environments, we do not see any variation associated with maximum temperatures. We also do not pick up very much signal of adaptation to, to precipitation. Um, but we do pick up a little bit around aridity. So, so different geographic areas have different constraints. And we, this is the same map for lodgepole pine, very similar pattern, but this one just points out that we have quite a bit of variation within populations. Now what this means is probably if these areas stay within the climatic niche of the species, over generations these tree, these tree species will be able to adapt. There's lots of variation there. However, it will take generations. And in the meantime, the forests are not going to be pretty, and they already aren't very pretty. We're doing, I just said, we don't pick up as strong a signal for drought hardiness with the lodgepole pine and the interior spruce, but we've got a big experiment underway killing Douglas fir right now. <laughs> uh, we've got Douglas fir from across Western North America. We had samples from Mexico, but we had very poor germination. And so we are doing drought experiments on those in the botany greenhouse at UBC. And uh, yes, my PhD student, Rafael Candido Ribeiro, is happy to report that he's killed lots of trees. <laughs> so finally, we have genomic data. And um, so we're using genomic data in combination with these seedling experiments to really speed up how quickly we can understand the extent of adaptation to climate and specifically what aspects of climate 
are the trees adapted to. Now climate is a very multifaceted thing and we can't reduce it to single variables. We've got seasonal variation in temperature, we've got seasonal variation in precipitation. It's really important what the ratio between those is because that, uh, that um, affects transpiration, uh, evapotranspiration rates, etc. Um, and then we get extreme events. So how do we do this with genomic data? Well, first of all, we can look at genomic markers for correlations with climate variables. For example, do we see elevational patterns where we see uh, here uh, marked in blue, we see the blue allele high, at higher frequency at high elevations and the green allele at more frequency at lower elevations. And do we see that pattern not just up one mountain, but up a bunch of mountains? So we look for what we call genotype environment associations. And we have had with uh, our work with lodgepole pine and interior spruce, we're doing this type of analysis with about one million genetic markers, single nucleotide polymorphisms, that is single changes in DNA letters at one place in the genome. And most of those one million SNPs, we call them SNPs, are within genes or within flanking regions that may be involved in, regula in, in gene regulation. And here's just an example. Um, these, these graphs represent clusters of SNPs that show similar patterns across the landscape. And for both of these, uh, both of these clusters are associated with, uh, with cold hardiness, or actually the inverse of that, cold injury. So if the, again, like the previous maps, if the circle is reddish, the, um, it means that the uh, provenance had low cold hardiness, and if it's dark blue, it had high cold hard hardiness. And this shows the pattern, similar patterns for each of these gene clusters, or, or marker clusters, where we see at higher elevation or at higher latitude, we see a higher frequency of these cold hardiness associated markers. So we see these, these uh, geographic patterns that make sense. The other thing we can do is associate uh, genetic markers with specific traits that we're interested in. This happens to be from one of our drought experiments, and I just made this up. But uh, we can look for whether we see, for a given DNA, at a given place in the genome, do we see one letter versus another associated with the ability, with cold hardiness, with drought hardiness, with growth, with phenology. And we do lots of phenological measurements on bud break timing, bud set timing, etc. So we put these methods together, and I'm not going to um, bore you with a lot of the results, even though I find them exciting. But I'll just, <laughs> but I'll just show you one thing. So we, did, we use both of these methods with pine, uh, with the lodgepole pine and with spruce. We looked at about a million SNPs in each of them. We sampled over 250 populations of each of them. And what we found was that in terms of adaptation to low temperatures, we found two to 400 genes that were involved in adaptation to low temperatures in each species. But we found that 47 of those overlap between the two species. And this um, were carrying on with this comparative genomics type of work, and we are hoping that we will be able to extend those candidates, those, that we will find that those 47 genes, or at least a good portion of them, overlap with other conifers. Now, you may say, well, so, like 47 genes in common, they're both evergreen conifers. Well, actually, these two species are separated by 140 million years of independent evolution. So Pinus and Picea diverged over 140 million years ago. So in fact, the fact that we're seeing this, th these genes are important, variation at these genes within species uh, is important, is, um, is fairly surprising. So foresters want to see phenotypic traits and information on phenotypic traits. If, if you can... Uh, first of all, if you've got a field planting and you can show trees are doing differently, suffering different levels of damage from different provenances, that is, that's really good evidence. If you could show them seedling uh, experiment results, it's going to be good information as well. The genomic stuff is a little bit distant and a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's not familiar. People don't have training in it. 
Um, but I just want to show you the kinds of patterns we're getting from some of the genomic analyses we're doing. And this is from the work of Ian McLaughlin, a former uh, PhD student. Um, so he, uh, he had provenance, he, he had a, a bunch of different provenances. He, um, he had natural provenances and he had breeding populations from the same area. So he had seed lots coming from seed orchards that contained uh, trees that had been selected uh, through progeny tests. And so the, the natural versus selected isn't the, isn't the point here. They were quite similar. But along the x-axis, you've got the provenance mean temperature. This is for lodgepole pine. The y-axis, you've got cold injury in our artificial freezing tests. And what you see is the typical pattern we see. Things from cold uh, climates develop cold hardiness faster in the fall, develop more cold hardiness. Things from warm climates are less cold hardy. And the same was true for the natural populations and the, and the bred populations. So those are the phenotypic traits. Lots of uh, work going into the common gardens to generate that. Now we can take the genomic markers from the same provenances and we can produce essentially the same graph. So what this illustrates is that we can understand climate adaptation just with the genomic markers. And this is a much more straightforward path. Um, these are very, uh, they're very new uh, results. Not many people have data sets similar to this. And so we're building confidence in these genomic tools. OK, so now it's interesting, Chris's talk about bringing in taxa that are uh, resilient to climate change, that are suited to new conditions. Uh, we're talking about natural forests, and we're talking about forests that are managed for native species. So people, a lot of, well, I should say, that, so there is some resistance to changing the paradigm from using local provenances to using provenances from elsewhere. Uh, there is a bit more uh, resistance to um, planting different species, but, but that, are, that are being geographically moved not very far, you know, a few hundred kilometers perhaps. Um, so what are the risks? Well, the risks people worry about are altered ecosystems. They worry about maladaptation if our predictions are wrong. But if we don't move things, in a forestry context, we're going to have low productivity, dropping timber supply, uh, and increased pests. From an ecological standpoint, we will certainly have altered ecosystems. I just want to go back to the maladaptation if, if uh, predictions are wrong and share with you one little anecdote before I go on. Because I, and I, I think this is a little bit uh, of a, um, a comment that although we have to move ahead, we've still got to exercise some caution. Three years ago, uh, seedlings, conifer seedlings were grown in nurseries in the interior. 10 to 20 million of those seedlings, they were lifted, put into cold storage for outplanting in the spring. When those plants came out of cold storage for planting, they discovered the roots were dead. 10 to 20 million seedlings. They had been cold damaged because in the fall, in the nurseries they were in, they had exceptionally warm weather, followed by a freeze event, followed by a heavy rain, followed by another freeze event. And that killed a lot of those seedlings. And I think there's still an ongoing lawsuit about whose fault that was. Unexpected. Climate's warming. So what happened there? Two things. Climate variability. The trees didn't harden sufficiently, but also, you know, roots don't get very cold hardy because it had been a, and it had been a warm fall. But the other thing is, the nursery managers had become lax. They used to put the, the styrofoam blocks that they grow the seedlings in, they would put them on the ground in the fall. And they would uh, either get snow or they would pack them in with straw or pack them in tightly so the roots didn't get too cold. But there were a bunch of warm falls. And it's hard work moving all those boxes of millions of seedlings. So they were keeping them up on the racks. So. Stuff happens. Uncertainty happens. And I can tell you right now, with 
the British Columbia situation that um, we have moved ahead. Assisted migration is going on in reforestation, but most of the movement is making up for climate change that has already happened, and we are targeting 10 to 20 years in the future for climate because of this risk of, of extreme events. So uh, just, just something to keep in mind in, in colder climates. Okay, I only, this was in my title. I only have one slide about it, but I don't think I need to tell you people about this. Um, there is an absolutely critical need to do ex situ seed collections at the rear edge of species ranges where we may see the extirpation of those populations. That is valuable genetic material. And we don't need one or two seed collections. We need big seed collections from lots of trees. And we need that seed to go into storage. And we need that seed to also get uh, planted, uh, um, to, to get used, to get planted. Um, but this is a real need. And my colleagues, for example, in Mexico, see that their seed production of many of their pine species is declining at the rear edge of the species range, at that hot, dry margin. So it's already getting to be late for some of those populations. And you all know we need high quality, diverse seed collections. And it must have accurate geospatial coordinates on that. Because as we move ahead, we need to not know what species it is or what country it came from. We need to know what place it came from so we can associate a climate with those collections. So with that, what do I think botanical gardens can do? Well, we heard a whole bunch of great things from Chris. And you know this better than I do, but I figured I should refer to this a little bit. Public education about the risks of climate change to forests, to species. Public gardens are great places to do this. And South of the border, you, we need this in Canada, but you need it even more south of the border, based on certain things. <laughs> uh, we, demonstration plantings are fantastic. You can put in a little demo planting that shows the effect of provenance. Hooker, back in the 1800s, he took uh, Himalayan pine and rhododendrons from different elevations in the Himalaya and planted them at Kew and demonstrated differences that Darwin wrote about in On the Origin of Species. How about putting in some trials like that for people today to understand the link between the plants and their climates? So not just species, sorry, that was the bullet point I just talked about. Demonstration of the importance of genetic diversity. Monitoring changes in phenology and health. Phenological databases need long-term records, and, and botanical gardens are great places to do this and to get your visitors to help. And ex situ collections of climate vulnerable species, which I already talked about. Here's two interesting species. White bark pine, we work on endangered, uh, listed under Canada Species at Risk Act. There is one white bark pine at Van Dusen Gardens, I believe. And uh, Cindy Sayer could confirm that for us. Um, Abies religiosa in Mexico. This is a species that, uh, is, that monarchs overwinter on in the monarch butterfly biosphere reserve. But the climate within that reserve is becoming unsuitable to Abies religiosa. There's a problem for you. OK, with that, I would like to acknowledge, uh, first of all, the organizers for inviting me. I would like to acknowledge my fabulous lab group and all of my um, collaborators and former students on our two large genomics projects, uh, Adaptree and Coadaptree, um, that are funded by Genome Canada, Genome BC, and other funding organizations. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Sally. So we have uh, five minutes also for questions. Uh, I think we're going to be doing a run around the room. Is that correct? OK, perfect. And we're promising a stretch break, a stretch break after our Q&A, OK? <laughs> Hi. Um, so early in your talk, you mentioned the spruce, as they colonize the, the islands in Alaska, um, appear to have the signature of hybridization with yeah. the more cold tolerant species yeah. that co-occurs in that region. And I'm wondering if um, you have any other thoughts or any other work that goes into looking at possibly using that kind of, you know, genetic 
recombination yeah. to to help things perhaps like the Abies in, yeah. in Mexico. So uh, I, in this in this case of the Abies in Mexico, actually there is some hybridization down there, but I don't understand that whole complex. In fact, the, my Mexican colleagues don't understand that complex. There's lots of room there uh, for work. Um, but in terms of spruce, in BC we all we have Sitka spruce, white spruce, Engelmann spruce. Um, they are all hybridizing. We have found populations of all combinations, and the, that natural hybridization that's, that's occurred has produced this vast amount of genetic diversity for adaptation. So, you know, Sitka spruce adapted to mild, extremely wet climates on the coast, fast-growing species, and you've got this, this complex that extends all the way to Engelmann spruce up at, at 2,000 meters or higher, uh, in cold environments with heavy snowpacks and, and continental climates to the boreal white spruce. And this, this genetic complex is incredible. And in fact, I have a PhD student working on that complex, and he's the third student I've had working on it. Um, and it's amazing the extent to which those hybrid populations, um, which are old, many generations of hybridization, have genomes that are a mosaic of those parental species. So if they're in a climate where the temperature resembles white spruce, but the precipitation resembles Engelmann spruce, they have temperature-associated alleles from white spruce and precipitation-associated alleles from Engelmann spruce. So it's, it's amazing that potential for hybridization to uh, create that diversity for adaptation. And my former student, Jill Hamilton, who worked on Sitka white spruce hybrids, has written about the potential role of hybridization in conservation um, and in climate change adaptation. So I would refer you to her work. Yes, oh, up in the back. And I should just mention, in that case, with the, the hybridization onto Kodiak Island, that actually, we don't think, we think that was actually um, not adaptive in that case, because Kodiak's quite mild. Um, but it was just the pollen that was available. And so we only see that hybridization happened in very early establishment, and it seems those hybrid individuals couldn't, couldn't compete with pure Sitka spruce as those populations got going. And that's another paper that my student's just working on. Yeah. Um, so a question about the, the material that you guys had worked with. The species and um, so on that you worked with in these experiments, has a very large native range. Mm -hmm. And it's a range that overlaps with a number of other species. So um, in theory, that would mean that genetically, these are more adaptable species anyway, um, because they occupy such a large range. Um, so then if you look at the inverse of that, then I guess it would be safe to assume that those species or genera that have a more limited range would uh, then be much less adaptable and much less resilient to the effects of climate change. So I wanted to um, see if you guys have worked on that inverse mm -hmm. and um, whether you have or haven't, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, there are some species that, there are species that have broad ranges and they have locally adapted populations, like the ones I've shown you. There's also species like western white pine that has a reasonably large range, doesn't have much at all in the way of population differences. But it seems to deal with the range of conditions by it, it breaks bud really late in the spring, and then it grows really fast for a short period of time, and then it shuts down. Um, so there's different ways to solve that, the dealing with a broad range of environments. However, species with very small ranges, um, you know, they are already at risk of extinction. Um, and just due to population sizes and extent and everything else, and climate change is a big threat. And I will mention a few conifers. Torrey Pine in Southern California, two populations, very small. There's some good work going on on that, but they're wrestling with this issue. Um, in Mexico, uh, Chihuahua spruce, so Mexico's got a whole bunch of them. One is Chihuahua spruce. Um, Abies religiosa is reasonably widespread at higher elevations in, in Mexico, but when you look at, um, but the climatic range is not that big. It's up on volcanoes and, and things. And when you run the um, projections forward, Brad St. Clair with the U.S. Forest Service did this, you find that 
the suitable habitat for Abies religiosa, there is some that will be in California, for example. And I think there is a rule, uh, there is room for conservation of that species by establishing it up there. Um, Brewer spruce is another one. Um, there are a bunch of them, and uh, those are just the ones that I know. And with mentioning that, there's another tool I want to mention to you, and it's great the U.S. Forest Service has sponsored this session. Brad St. Clair of the U.S. Forest Service in Corvallis has de developed a tool called the Seed Lot Selection Tool, where you can play around with climate for North America, um, and you can look for, you can pick a spot, your botanical garden, and you can look for places that, that have similar climates to what you expect for your location in the future. It's a very flexible tool. It doesn't tell you what climate variables to use, but it makes all the climate variables in Climate NA available to you. And I recommend you play with that. And keep in mind, of course, that your gardens are probably in, in urban heat islands and a little bit warmer. More than one of the above. So this is really interesting in, co oh, and I totally forgot, so thank you so much, Pam. Um, this is really interesting in combination with the poll that Chris did, because Chris found, you know, your answer is that some of you, your gardens are, aren't doing anything about this, and some of you, you're just doing a little bit, but you know you need to do it. So that's, that's really interesting. Yes. I probably used up my five minutes. Okay.